Thank you. So hello everyone, on behalf of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Audubon, Vermont, and Highstead, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. We have a great program lined up for you. My name is Sarah Barker, and I am the director of the Cornell Land Trust Conservation Initiative at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And through this national program, we work to advance the pace and impact of land trust protection and stewardship efforts through birds. And I am joined today by two co-hosts, Katie Blake, who is a conservationist with Highstead and supports the work of the Regional Conservation Partnership in the Northeast, as well as Steve Hagenbu, a conservation biologist and forester at Audubon, Vermont, who will be running this webinar and who I'll be turning it over to in just a few minutes. So this webinar, um, Steve, if you could move forward to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. Uh, this webinar, it's called Habitat Requirements and Management Considerations for Forest Birds in New England, is the second of four webinars in our series. Next slide, please, Steve. And in this webinar, we will explore and promote an understanding of what forest conditions and attributes provide high quality nesting and foraging habitat for a range of priority bird species that are found in the Northeast. And last week's webinar was titled The Power of Birds in Driving and Sustaining Forest Management Within the RCP Network. And this looked at how birds and bird habitats are effective motivators for engaging landowners in active forest stewardship, as well as how the RCP network can utilize birds as ambassadors for sustainable, sustainable forest management. And just to note that these webinars are all being recorded and they will be posted on the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative website to serve as future reference materials. And we'll also post the link to the recording of the first webinar in the chat shortly for those of you who um, may have missed it. Oh, I think Katie just posted it, thank you. And as a reminder, um, continuing forestry education credits are available for this webinar. And we'll provide a link to a Google attendance sheet in the chat at the very end of the webinar. So to re receive credits, you must sign this Google doc. So don't forget to do that. Okay, next slide, Steve. Oh, I think you're there with the logos. So this webinar series is brought to you by the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative. And this, it's represented here by this incredibly diverse suite of participating partners. And this initiative is a collaborative effort between the Regional Conservation Partnership and their partners, Audubon Groups, Highstead, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so the goal of the initiative is to help uh, the RCPs connect with bird conservation in ways that advance and expand their efforts, their partnerships, and as well as their ecological priorities. This group also aims to raise awareness and collective knowledge about the importance of bird conservation and the role of RCPs um, and landowners can play in protecting and restoring habitats for declining populations. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology supports the initiative by serving as a co-leading organization with Highstead, and thus I serve as a co-lead along with my partner, and as I mentioned, my co-host today, Katie Blake, and the initiative received a grant that allowed us to put together this webinar series specifically geared toward RCPs and land trust leaders in order to bring you the tools you need for your conservation and management practices. So next slide, Steve, please. So I'd like to now turn it over to our program host for today, Steve Hagenboo. And Steve has worked with Audubon in a variety of roles since 1998. Currently, he is senior conservation biologist and forester with Audubon's v Vermont's Healthy Forest Initiative. And in this position, Steve works with private landowners, municipalities, foresters, land managers, as well as other conservation partners to promote management activities that will enhance the health and habitat value of forest land for priority bird species. He played a key role in developing the national award-winning Foresters for the Bird program. And more recently, bird-friendly maple. So in 2009, Steve obtained his master's degree in conservation biology from Antioch University in New England. 
His graduate research investigated the implications of maple sugarbush management for neotropical migrant songbirds. And when not in the woods on business, Steve can um, still be found there, hiking and mountain biking, backcountry skiing, exploring with his kids, or whatever else seems like fun. So Steve, his wife, Dana, and their two children, they live in um, Waterbury Center, Vermont, where they run a small farm business. So take it away, Steve. Great, thanks, Sarah. All right, and good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank you all for, for making some time this afternoon to, to join us um, and to be part of this, this webinar series. And I, I really also wanna thank um, Highstead and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initiative for, for giving Audubon the opportunity to be part of this series um, and to share with the RCP network and others the real um, valuable aspects of that, that come along with thinking about managing forests with birds in mind. So I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. As Sarah said, um, and some of you may know if you were here on the first, um, the first webinar last week, this is a four part series. Um, and I apologize if you're hearing a dog bark in the background, hopefully that will uh, end shortly. But um, the first webinar in a four part series um, that is really designed to kind of build on one another. So um, it's not ne absolutely necessary that, that someone be present for all four webinars to get the full benefit, but they certainly will be aspects that will kind of be hitting on, on different marks as we go through the different webinars. And each webinar will also be recorded, as you know, um, and those recordings will be made available to folks um, after the webinar so that you can always go back and catch up on one you missed or if you'd like to, to review things here once again. Um, in just a little bit, we'll um, also be joined by Dan Kilborn, um, who is a forester with the Vermont Land Trust, and he's going to bring really a, a practitioner's perspective to the uh, topic here that we'll be discussing today and how he's thought about that in some of the, the forest management that he does. And then I guess the last thing, just kind of on a, on a housekeeping note um, to finish up before we dive into things, um, we certainly welcome folks' uh, questions to, um, to come along with us here today, but if you would go ahead and just enter those in the chat and then we'll kind of get to those at the end of the presentation as opposed to kind of addressing them on the fly. So go ahead and type in any questions you have or comments along the way and we'll make sure that we have um, time for that at the end of the presentation. So um, again, for folks that may not be familiar with Audubon, um, Audubon Vermont is the state program of the National Audubon Society and our, our mission uh, quite And look at that. You haven't heard me say anything, have you? I'm realizing. Um, my apologies that I, I for, forgot that I had myself on mute. So no, that was um, me. I just muted oh, you by accident. Okay. I'm Ooh, so boy, sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> just I, I, your I last really sentence we missed. I'm sorry. So, so thank, that's fine. Thank you, Katie. Um, so really just to pick up, um, Audubon is the state program of the National Audubon Society. And um, our mission is to really protect birds in the places that they need today and tomorrow. And so here in Vermont, um, as I mentioned, excuse me, in the Northeast, I should say, um, as I mentioned last week, our forests are really among the most important places that our birds need and henceforth the reason that we're, we're focusing on them in this webinar series. So we're talking today about habitat requirements and, and some um, management considerations that kind of come along with with managing our forests with birds in mind. And I really wanted to just start kind of at, at a most basic level. We, we talk about habitat, habitat, habitat all the time. And sometimes it's easy to, to overlook the fact that it would be good to ground ourselves really in the basic ideas of what habitat is, but particularly from the perspective of these forest nesting birds. So that's what we're gonna do here to start off. And, and this will take us back to our, probably to our grade school days when we actually first started to, to learn about habitat. Um, but again, it will be specific to thinking about our forest birds. Um, before we do that though, um, actually I'll just skip over this because we've kind of already had just kind of a review of, of what the last webinar was. So into the habitat basics. Um, food, certainly one of the primary components that we, um, we think about when we think about habitat and when it comes to our forest nesting birds in particular, one of the most important food sources that they're um, looking for during their time here when they're in the, in the breeding season of the summer in particular, which is what we're, we're kind of focusing on right now, are insects, whether that be 
um, adult flying insects like, like flycatchers we see here on the, the upper right photo maybe going after, or um, it could be the larva um, of different insects um, or even spiders and other um, invertebrates that are in the, in the forest leaf litter layer. But this is a really critical part of, of thinking about the habitat of birds and making sure that we have a landscape that provides um, a high diversity of insects for those birds to be feeding, not just for themselves, but also for the young that hopefully they're able to raise when they're here with us. But as we move into late summer and early fall time of year that we're in right now, a lot of these birds, which again, um, if you remember, if you were here last week and remember, we talked a lot about these neotropical migrants, um, birds that are only with us here in the Northeast for a few months of the year, and then they, they head to some other place for the winter. Um, as they get ready for that fall migration, they start to add to their diet um, a, a much larger component of native fruits. And those fruits are actually what will help them to put on the fat layer that will sustain them in their migration south. And so we have to also be thinking about providing a landscape that is um, rich in, in plant species, native plant species that will produce those fruits to help those birds be in the highest level of fitness that they can be when they leave on their fall migration. We also know that uh, Cover is, a, is an important aspect of habitat. And in, when we think about birds, cover really has two, two main um, functions that it offers for our birds. The one I wanna really focus in on is the, the, the habitat cover being um, for nesting purposes. So our bird species that we find here in our Northeastern forest um, nest in all different layers of, the, um, of our forest, as we mentioned again last time. They're not just in the tops of the trees. So we want to make sure that we have places where, whether it be a ground nesting bird like a veery, as we see there, the nest of right on the ground underneath that fern um, in the bottom left, or a black-throated blue warbler that we see kind of in the middle photo there, nesting in a nice dense patch of hobble bush, or it could be for cavity nesters um, in aspen, like we see there, the yellow-bellied sapsucker nest highlighted by the, the red circle um, on the right side. So just being aware that that having good cover in all layers of the forest is really a requirement in order to ensure we have habitat for that full suite of bird species that we're focusing on. And then space. We'll probably say, well, you missed one being water. Um, and that is true. Water is certainly a necessity for all of these birds. Many of the forest birds get the majority of the water they need from that insect or from the, the, the fruits that they're, um, they're feeding on. But they also go to bodies of water, natural bodies of water, streams, ponds, lakes, and things like that um, to get that water as well. But again, most of that's going to come from, um, from the foods that they're, that they're eating. So the last item being space. And, and really, from the, the ideal of forest birds, we are looking for lar these large, intact forest blocks. So making sure that we have that space for them to go about and find the cover they need for nesting and, and staying um, away from predation. Um, to find the food sources that they need and the insects, they need to have that space. So kind of grounding ourselves in that, then we can think about how does this all relate now specifically um, to, to the specific habitat requirements of our forest birds. Before we jump into the, some of the, the real detailed things that we might look for at the stand level, the forest stand level, I wanted to also just bring us back to um, a topic that we, we started to discuss in last week's webinar. And that being these really, what I think of as two primary forest habitat conditions that our birds are looking for from a, from a nesting perspective. On the left side, we find this mature forest, which again, to describe it, it's the place that a lot of people um, think about when they think of forest. There are these nice in the summer months on a hot day, they're the places that we can go and find uh, shade. It's a little bit cooler in there that, you know, the trees are maybe 60, 80 feet tall. The canopy is fairly closed in. So providing that shade, but there could be little holes in the canopy, canopy gaps as we call them here and there. Um, and then there could be, or there could not be different layers of vegetation. We're gonna to to get more on that here in just a little bit, but it's really a condition, this mature forest. Um, a lot of times we like to make sure that we do define that because mature could mean to some folks that it's um, financially mature, um, and ready for harvest from that perspective, but it's really more, or, or old growth. Um, it it ne doesn't necessarily need to be either of those. It's more of a, of a condition of the woods with this relatively high, relatively closed in canopy that then attracts this suite of bird species that we see here. 
um, on the left, and we'll just kind of go around them there. Starting in the in the upper left, we've got our yellow-bellied sapsucker. Below it is a wood thrush, kind of going up at a diagonal to the right there. That the bluish um, bluish headed bird is the blue headed vireo. Above that, the black throated green warbler, and up to the right above that, our scarlet tanager. Down below to the eastern wood peewee and then the black-throated blue warbler on the bottom right. So those are all birds that are really looking for that mature forest condition um, for their nesting habitat. Switching over to young forest, these are the places we go in the summer months where we stand out there and it's hot. There's, there's really um, little, if any, um, overstory or canopy overhead. So we're standing out in this, this open area. And as a result of that um, lack of overstory, we tend to be find ourselves in really dense, densely vegetated areas. It could be things like raspberries and blackberries. It could be uh, native trees and shrubs, or unfortunately it could also be comprised of some non-natives as well. But very, very low dense cover um, kind of is a, one, of the, one of the factors that really attract the birds that are gonna be nesting there. Um, and here we're gonna find birds like from on the left side, top left there is the chestnut-sided warbler, down below it, the white-throated sparrow, Canada warbler to the right of that, Veery in the upper right, and then the American woodcock, the young of the American woodcock in this photo down there in the lower right. So those are the kind of the primary conditions. Now we're gonna, the different attributes of a forest that, that we really think about as being important for habitat um, apply to both young forest and mature forest, but we're gonna look at it today from the perspective of the mature forest, but just note that these same, same things that we look for in a forest are the same kinds of things we'd be looking for in our young forest as well. Okay, so one of the first things, and again, this is, this is what we call a stand level habitat attribute, and a forest stand um, is essentially a place, it's a management unit, it's a place of somewhat uniform species composition or forest structure or management objectives for, for a particular place in the forest that we think of. So it's kind of a, it's a discrete unit that, that we're gonna be managing within for similar characteristics. So when we look at a forest stand, we're looking for specific um, things that are either present or absent. Um, and that'll tell us a little bit about the quality of the habitat and which of those bird species from the previous slide we may expect or not expect to find out there. So the first one here is related to what we call that forest structure. It's, it's the way that different plant species are arranged in the forest. Um, and we look at it really a forest in, in three layers. Here is, is shown two, but the third layer being really the canopy and the overstory overhead. Um, but we look for this, those two layers down below it. The first one being understory and the second being the midstory. And this would be a place that, um, or this would be vegetation that is woody stemmed in nature. So um, ferns typically do not count um, in that forest structure, but it's woody stem vegetation that's one to six feet in height making up that midstory, excuse me, the understory, and then vegetation that goes from that six foot height up to about 30 feet height, or in most forests, kind of the mid canopy layer. Um, that makes up the midstory. The photo that we see along with this picture, uh, excuse me, this slide, um, you'll kind of see is very much lacking uh, for the most part in that structure, those, those lower two layers of the understory and midstory. So this is not the image that we would be trying to, um, to create or enhance um, in order to have a higher quality bird habitat. Instead, what we wanna see is something that looks more like this. So this is actually in a uh, sugar bush that I was in this, this summer with, um, this is a forestry intern that worked with me, Asha, uh, who may be on the webinar today. Hi, Asha, if you're here. Um, and this was a place that I really was, was excited to see that there was actually pretty well established forest structure um, in this maple sugar bush. So, uh, we'll have our ferns, these maidenhair ferns kind of in the foreground. So I just mentioned those don't really count in the structure. So I want us to kind of look beyond that a little bit past it to some of the, the saplings that are within that first six feet of the ground. And then as we move over here to the left side of the photo, you'll see that there's a pretty well established midstory of, of saplings that are within that six to 30 foot layer. And when we have a forest that has the structure like this, we are providing the habitat for nesting. Um, for birds like our black throated blue warbler, which pretty much exclusively nests in that understory layer, as well as habitat for wood thrush, which is typically found more within that, that midstory, that six to 30 foot height range. So if we go back to the slide before, 
Again, we'll see that those layers are not really represented. The habitat quality here for birds that need those, those conditions is going to be much lower than what we see right here. So these are the, the first two stand level habitat attributes that we look for when we go into a forest and we think about the quality of habitats that, that's there and what bird species may be accommodated. The next thing we're going to be looking at is actually the dead stuff. So um, what we call downed woody material. Oftentimes you'll hear this like, like downed woody debris or coarse woody debris. I really like to use the word material um, from the standpoint that the word debris kind of just by nature means it seems to, to connotate that it's, it's not valuable, um, it's trashy, and that's not the case at all. So downed woody material is my, my word choice here. And we look at downed woody material in two categories. The first being that coarse woody, so in the material on the forest floor that's um, 10 inches in diameter or greater and at least three feet in length. When we think about how much of that material would be desirable to have, it's a hard number to come up with um, because it really depends on what it is that you're in your objective, what are you trying to achieve. From the bird habitat perspective, we don't really have a lot of good science currently about what is a desirable target for this, these uh, pieces of coarse woody material on the forest floor. But some of the data that I've collected over the years um, in different northern hardwood and, and mixed with forest stands here in Vermont would seem to, to suggest that our forests right now have typically between 20 and 40 pieces or uh, pieces of this coarse woody material per acre, um, which may be enough, it may not be enough for birds, um, but it's kind of a baseline that we are that we're really starting with in a lot of today's forest here that that I've had a chance to spend time in. So kind of a question mark there, and something that's really um, a need for some future research to to look into that a little bit more specifically from from the bird habitat perspective. And then the fine woody material. These are the tops. These are the the, the um, tops of trees. Let's say after a harvest that we can leave those finer branches, typically we think of them as four inches in diameter or less, leave those on the forest floor um, as they provide a lot of not only bird habitat, place cover for birds to be um, nesting in or escaping from predation. There also tends to be a lot of insects in there, particularly early in the, in the season, in the summer. Um, so, so that's a great place that we find birds often going to forage for those insects. And it also helps to protect the, um, any new young trees, seedlings that, that hopefully will be growing on the site, help to protect them from, from deer browse in places where deer um, may be influencing that. So this picture really shows both the coarse woody material and the fine woody material. I would um, dare say that this is probably one of the hardest things um, to convey to, to folks um, in terms of like a desirable characteristic to have on the forest floor or, or in the forest, because it looks very messy. And our mantra is that messy is good. Um, having a messy forest floor means we have this downward material that's providing those different ecosystem services and values for us. But it's really hard for a lot of folks to appreciate um, the look of this. So always working to help people understand that there's uh, it may not fit the aesthetic that we think of and that we might find desirable, but we can still appreciate the beauty of this um, for the ecosystem values that it provides us. So by having that material on the forest floor, we'll find for the coarse woody material, really one of the kind of the iconic bird species that, that we, um, we think about is this bird, the ruffed grouse. Um, those down logs are really a critical place for the males of the ruffed grouse to get up onto. To, to drum, which is kind of their courtship display. They, they're not songbirds, so they use their wings, beating them against the sides of their body for the, what we call drumming. Um, and getting up onto a perch to do that is something that they look for. So down woody material, coarse woody material in particular, really serves that valuable function of drumming sites for our rough grouse. And then the, the fine woody material, um, we find numerous times where the, this bird, which is an oven bird, one of our most common woodland warblers here in the Northeast, um, will actually place its nest as a ground nester right on the ground in the middle of some of this down woody material, the, the fine stuff um, or the slash piles um, after a harvest. So those are just two birds that, that are benefiting from having this, this kind of material, this mess, if you will, on our forest floor. And then we're gonna move on to the stuff that, that is really pre 
um, down woody material, and that being standing deadwood um, or standing cavity trees, because they're really two different things. So snags are standing dead trees. Cavity trees can be dead or they can be live and still have holes or cavities in them. So to start off with um, here, we have, this is um, sugar maple in my own, my own personal sugar bush um, that I manage. And this was something that I really um, love to find. It's um, just littered there on the, the stem on the right being littered with, with holes, large holes. Those were all excavated by uh, this group of birds here. These are pileated woodpeckers. And those are foraging, excuse me, uh, yeah, foraging cavities um, that the pileated woodpeckers um, seek out the insects in that standing dead tree. So that is a snag itself. It's not living anymore. Um, and in fact, since this picture was taken, it has since become coarse woody material on the forest floor as it has fallen um, on its own. But um, so that's a kind of an example of the, of the snags. But we also look for these trees. So this is the same image I showed you a little bit earlier of, of an aspen tree. Um, in the middle of that red circle being a cavity. So that's a small hole that was excavated by this bird, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. So yellow-bellied sapsuckers, um, they excavate their cavities. They tend to, to, if they can find these live trees, and aspen's really highly selected for this purpose because they start to decay on the inside um, before you might see anything going on the outside. And the birds seem to know that. And so they go find these trees and they can excavate into that hollow decay cavity in the tree, and that's where they'll put their, uh, lay their eggs and their young will uh, develop within there. This one we do have some, some desirable metrics for, some desirable targets to be aiming for. Um, typically what we think about is trying to encourage a minimum of six um, snags and or cavity trees per acre. The bigger the better is a, is a good way to think about it. So things that are bigger than 10 inches in diameter are certainly more desirable than a three or four inch diameter snag, just because more species can utilize it um, than a small one. And then we get down a little bit more, um, more specifics there. Of those six per acre, if we can have at least one that's um, 18 inches in diameter or greater, if it's trees of that size are present in the forest, and then three that are of 16 inches or of diameter or greater. So again, the, the idea of just being bigger is better, um, trying to maintain those snags in our operations and our forest management um, so that these um, cavity nesting birds have what they look for in their habitat requirements. So that kind of wraps up the stand level stuff. Um, but as I, th I think we hit on a little bit last time, birds, really are responding to, to, the, to a greater landscape around them. So they're not seeing um, corner pins, they're not seeing painted boundary lines on our trees to, to delineate a, a property's boundary. They just see the land. And so when we think about what habitat attributes are at the stand level and how we might manage at that stand level, that is influenced a bit by what is the landscape offering to us. So I wanted to present to you kind of a, an idea of, of the value in looking broader than the property that were um, it's up for consideration. Um, this is a map that shows a property that I was looking at. That's the yellow outline property. But it then the red line around it shows um, an area that's a 2,500 acre landscape. And so we look at that. That 2,500 acres is kind of a, a standard that we use for looking at landscape context. Um, it comes out of some of the work actually that was around managing our forest for uh, scarlet tanagers and for our forest thrushes. Kind of, it has become somewhat of a, a common acreage for looking at landscapes when it comes specifically to bird habitat. So what's within that 2,500 acre landscape? You can help us think about, all right, this property that I'm looking at, does it offer anything different? Um, is it similar to everything that's around me? And that can then serve as a guide for what Part, a part of the guide and how we might think about managing this, this particular parcel. So um, here in Vermont, I'll use as kind of the case study for this, we have developed a guideline for what we think is a desirable target for kind of the, the, um, the arrangement between young forest conditions and mature forest conditions. This tends to be a kind of a, a hot topic that comes up a lot, like how much do we want of any condition on the landscape? I often say that if you ask 10 different foresters or biologists, um, that question, you might get 12 answers because it seems to be all over the map where people are. I will say that, that Audubon has taken a bit of a conservative approach to this. So we suggest at any given time in these forested landscapes, three to 5% of that be in young forest. 
Remember, that's that open canopy condition. Typically, it's it lasts from zero to 15 years after whatever event disturbance created it. That could be a, a windstorm or it could be a harvest. Um, so three to five percent of the landscape in that young forest condition at any given time, and then greater than 70 percent um, in a more structurally complex. So having those those attributes that we just covered um, condition. And our guidelines are really our starting point guidelines, what I should call them, are really based in thinking about what are the, the natural disturbance patterns and regimes that influence our northern hardwood forest and mixed forest, which is our, our primary forest type here. Um, and those are small gap disturbances. So they're kind of opening up small amounts of the, ca of the canopy um, at any given uh, time, as opposed to creating five to 10 acre openings. So that's really where, and, and some of the evidence is su suggesting that um, pre-settlement that the, the Vermont forest landscape was in something similar to this, this condition, if not even a little bit uh, lower amount of young forest than what we're recommending today. Um, sometimes you'll see guidelines that go up to 10%, or 15% of the landscape. And it really, there, there can be a lot of um, leeway and wiggle room in that, but we like to think, let's start with this three to 5% and then go from there. You can adjust it accordingly. So then the other, the other thing is comparing that last landscape to this one. This is another property in yellow that has a 2,500 acre landscape around it. You can see this was much more of a patchwork of forest, open land, agricultural land, residential development. And so by, by default, we might think a little bit differently about what conditions would be most desirable to manage for from bird habitat, given that landscape context to it. And I'm gonna um, end things right there on that. And, and as I mentioned before, we're gonna have now Dan Kilborn from the Vermont Land Trust speak with us. And I, and I think it's really valuable to have this, um, Dan as a practitioner working on the ground, managing forest, to have his perspective on how um, managing forests with birds in mind, thinking about those habitat requirements of those species has helped him to um, help influence some of the management that has been happening on the Vermont Land Trust home lands. Um, so just kind of a quick introduction to Dan. Um, I've known Dan for, for quite a few years. Um, he's been really active um, and engaged with Audubon Vermont's um, foresters for the birds, all of our forest programs that we've been doing now for about 15, 16 years. Dan's been there right from the beginning, um, really helping to contribute to our understanding of forestry um, and then bringing some of this, those ideas to the management that he has. So uh, he's, he's an all around great guy and I'm really glad that he's here with us to share his perspective on how this can, can play out in, in the real world. So with that, Dan, I'll turn the reins over to you and then you just, just ask me when you wanna advance the slides. Very good, thanks, Steve. Um... Thanks for that intro. Great to be here with you all today to talk about birds and bird habitat. And yeah, it's gonna be fun to really um, kind of present a case study of one property um, where we'll be touching on all the points that Steve has just described. So, but you know, as Steve said, you know, my name is Dan Kilborn, forester with the Vermont Land Trust. Um, I work mostly in the Northeastern part of Vermont. Um, so I guess quickly for folks uh, who may not be familiar with VLT, we're a, we're a statewide nonprofit focused on land conservation. Um, conservation easements have been a primary tool for us uh, and our focus to protect working farms and working forests in the state. Um, and as we look more closely at our work with landowners and communities, we're really starting to expand our, our scope to include more deliberate strategies to encourage connections between people and land. Um, and, as, and as Steve described, and I think really the first webinar was dedicated to, we've we found that thinking about birds and their habitat needs is really an excellent way to connect people to their land um, and thinking about management strategies and, and what's important to them. Um, here at VLT, we hold conservation easements on about 600,000 acres in the state and we work with nearly 2000 landowners. So we're fortunate to have lots of connections. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we own a few thousand acres in feet um, that we manage for conservation and demonstration purposes. Uh, and we've partnered with Audubon on several of these properties, uh, one of which we'll visit right now. Steve can uh, go ahead and take us to um, the Mud Pond Demonstration Forest in Greensboro. This property is located up in Orleans County, Vermont. It's about 360 acres. Um, it's entirely forested uh, with you know, some, some open wetlands around Mud Pond over there to the east. 
Uh, the lot has a very interesting history. Uh, it's very similar in land use to lots of parcels in our region. So portions were cleared for agricultural use and then uh, abandoned and reforested. This parcel actually went into industrial ownership for a while and was part of the Diamond International land sale in the 80s, uh, which is a whole story uh, itself, um, but was purchased out of that sale by the Murdoch family as a timber investment. They owned it for about 20 years. And when they decided the time was right for them to sell, uh, VLT was able to partner with the Greensboro Land Trust and the Freeman Foundation to purchase it in 2005. Um, so we've owned it since that time. And around 2010, 2011, when we were really getting ready to start some active management here, uh, we were able to partner with Audubon Vermont to become one of the nine original demonstration sites for the Foresters for the Birds program, uh, demonstrating civil culture with birds in mind. Um, and it's been kind of a real learning journey and joy for me to be able to, uh, to have taken all the learning that I've had um, from Steve and others um, and, and to be able to apply it and continue learning as, as we go. So we're going to talk about um, specifically about the management considerations in our planning process over the last uh, 10 years. So Steve, you can take us ahead. Um, and uh, you know, the first step in any planning process is goal setting, right? And because of our demonstration focus here and our partnership with the Foresters for the Birds program, Steve can um, show us here, yes, that uh, enhancing forest bird habitat is an obvious number one goal for us. Um, but perhaps one of the things that I like best about managing for birds is how well this objective can dovetail with other ownership goals. So, um, you know, we're interested at VLT in helping folks manage their properties for a diversity of items. And just to mention a, a few here that, have, that Steve has added, um, periodic timber income, maintenance of forest health and increasing climate resilience. And like the photo to the right shows here, uh, thinking about how to manage your ash in the face of emerald ash borer. And, and what's really great is that all of these goals are compatible with or even enhance our management for forest bird habitat. And Steve, you can take us forward. Um, so once we've identified those initial goals, you know, we partnered with Audubon to conduct a forest bird habitat assessment. And this was really um, kind of a general overview of the forest conditions to look at the big picture, high level characteristics that are separating the habitats for birds out there. So where's the mixed wood? Where's the hardwood? Where's the softwood? What are the general age classes? Um, this original assessment was done in 2011 by Kristen Sharpless, who was working with Audubon at the time. Um, and as Steve uh, talked about thinking big picture beyond our boundaries, birds don't know where our corners are. Um, we thought it would be helpful to think beyond our property boundaries in this case uh, and invite our neighbor, the Nature Conservancy, um, to include, uh, Steve, you can actually go back for just a second, um, to include their 500 acres in our habitat assessment um, to, uh, for the property that they own directly to the west of the mud pond forest, uh, their long pond preserve. So in total, we have um, 900 acres to consider in our assessment. And now, Steve, you can advance for us. Um, but when we're thinking about the landscape, bigger is often better. And as you heard Steve say, um, 2,500 acres is a common um, kind of unit to be thinking about landscape scale. Um, and that's what's demonstrated here around the two properties with the yellow line. Uh, if we look at the chart on the left, this came right out of our forest bird habitat assessment. And Steve's gone over these considerations. Um, but we see that target again of three to 5% of the landscape and larger openings to support the bird, can, bird species that need those conditions. And then uh, for us, we might have another 15 to 20% in medium sized gaps that are generally less than an acre, kind of adding some small scale diversity, but would really be embedded in the remainder of that, um, say up to 80% up to that's kind of in a generally closed canopy condition. So how do we assess that? Well. Just a few years ago, we started seeing the development of LIDAR technology. And LIDAR is just an acronym for the process that's used to shoot a laser from the air down to the a surface uh, and recording its elevation by how long it takes to bounce back. So you've probably seen uh, hillshade topography 
developed uh, from this technology, but it can also be used to, to measure canopy height. And in Vermont, we have a publicly available uh, canopy height data set that's available to us through our GIS clearinghouse, VCGI. And this data is from back in 2015. And that's what we're looking at here on the, on the map on the right, uh, a map showing the difference in canopy heights. So yellow is the tallest trees, blue is the short ones, and white is, is something that's open, either it's developed or ag land or been recently harvested. Um, and we can use this information about canopy height as a rough proxy to determine that, that age of the forest cover. So if we wanna get a rough measurement on how much young forest is in the landscape, we can look at the white and the blue. Um, now, some of the white and the blue here is really showing forested wetlands and drainages, and we wouldn't expect it to mature uh, much past this date. And you know, we know it's important, providing important habitat and function uh, now. Um, but Steve can go ahead and highlight a few areas of upland that are uh, that are also showing up in, in white and blue. Um, these these are the young forests, the short trees. Um, and if we actually measure these, we can we find that within our 2,500 acre block, we're we're right about at that 5% target, um, which for us means that during our planning period, we're going to focus on mature forest. Uh, you know, we'll be creating small and medium sized canopy gaps, but our neighbors um, have taken care of those larger block young forest needs uh, for now. Um, and like Steve said, we know that in the future, uh, if we decide we need more young forest on the landscape or if this uh, these sections mature out and it's not available, we can adjust our management strategies to, to achieve our goals. So we can go ahead and then uh, and look at our inventory. So after this higher level kind of rapid habitat type assessment, we wanted to design an inventory that we could use to break uh, the woods into these forest stands that Steve described, these uh, smaller management units where we'll be making specific silvicultural recommendations. So as a demonstration site, we wanted to establish plots that we would use to monitor the changes in both bird use and vegetation. Um, so the red plots are our annual bird surveys. Uh, and the, uh, the remainder are vegetation surveys that we measure periodically. And Steve, you can go ahead again for us. So within our inventory, you know, we collected all the traditional measures that would be in a timber inventory um, at each plot, stocking, species, diameter volumes. But we also collected information on the specific habitat attributes that Steve reviewed earlier. So canopy height, crown closure at different levels of the forest. Um, mast, invasives, leaf litter, deadwood. Um, and while some of these attributes may be collected in a standard inventory, uh, it's likely they would be used for different purposes. And for our needs here, we wanted to specifically uh, inform our management for habitat conditions. Steve, you can go ahead again. So, so what does this data tell us? Um, we can look at stand one, a mature even age hardwood stand on this property. Uh, this area outlined in red is, is a subsection stand 1B. This is scheduled to be harvested later this winter. So here we have before harvest data. Um, apologies for all the info jammed on the left side of the slide, but I'll, I'll summarize it quickly. Um, it's really telling us that this is a highly stocked stand. It's a northern hardwood, uh, sugar maple dominated, rich, rich northern hardwood forest, has a, a large mean stand diameter. So this means there's lots of good sized trees, right? And if we look specifically at the structure, composition and habitat condition, we'll see that we have uh, a tall canopy height over 60 feet, pretty uniform distribution uh, with a high crown closure at 87%. We have mid-story and understory cover about 50%. So that's not terrible, but could be better developed. Um, not a lot of soft mast, no invasives, which is good, good leaf litter component. Um, we have some downwood, um, about 10 pieces of coarse woody material, six piles of fine woody material per acre. Um, and we're starting to get some development of snags, but not a good representation of those large snags yet. And if we, if we try to fine tune this now to our uh, more specific management objectives, Steve, you can go ahead to the next slide. We'll use this data to develop those really uh, stand level management objectives. Um, 
we want to transition this area away from being in an even age condition more toward a multi-age condition. We want to produce high quality forest products. We want to enhance uh, forest bird habitat and while we're thinking about recreation and demonstration opportunities. But then here we can get really specific and we can think about some of the things that we'll do um, that will impact specific species of birds, like uh, increases in individual crown growth from our tending that'll be good for scarlet tanagers and wood thrush. Um, we wanna keep a, a dense uh, canopy closure. That's gonna be good for species like black-throated green warblers, wood thrush, tanagers, and oven birds. We wanna create some canopy gaps to enhance uh, structure and understory development. So that's gonna be good for, for bird species that like that thicker understory layer in that zero to six foot range. Uh, Black-throated blues, berries, uh, birds that will hunt insects in these gaps like eastern wood peewees will also be using them. And we wanna uh, create more snags and cavities and down wood. Um, good for birds like sapsuckers, which Steve touched on with uh, nesting cavities in the aspen. And grouse will be using uh, the down wood as drumming sites. So uh, let's look and see how we did with some management outcomes. If, um, if we look at a subset of stand one, which is stand 1A, highlighted here in red, north of stand 1B. Um, this area received a variable retention thinning from the Civil Culture with Birds in Mind Handbook uh, during the years uh, 2013 to 2016. And so we have some post-harvest data here that's generally three to five years old. Or three to five years post-harvest when we collected it. And while we know that uh, vegetation response doesn't occur overnight, it really happens on a continuum. And we have to be willing to think in forest time, which means measuring changes and success over decades. We do have some early results. Um, <clears throat> so we still have a relatively high basal area, mean stand diameter. So we have a bunch of those big trees left. Um, we maintain that tall canopy height over 60 feet and still have a crown closure of uh, above uh, 70, 80, 74%. And we've also increased our mid-story and understory cover from 50 up to 75%. Our soft mast uh, hasn't increased a lot, which is to be expected given how much canopy we're retaining here. But um, I can guarantee that it has increased in the canopy gaps that we made. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see these white holes in the stand, which are the canopy gaps ranging up to one acre in size. And I guess, by the way, if you're noticing that the western side of the stand looks a little different, that's because this LIDAR data was taken in 2015, the year before we finished up the last section of that harvest. So uh, if this was updated, it would actually look pretty similar. Um, and then back to the data, uh, no invasive species, that's good. We still have a good leaf litter component. We have um, similar amounts of coarse woody material on the ground, but our fine woody material is doubled. Uh, which is to be expected from uh, the tops and the uh, other debris associated from the harvest. And our stand, uh, our sna our snag numbers um, are still pretty similar to the previous measurement, um, but I'd expect those to increase over time as our legacy and retention trees have the opportunity to mature and die. And let's go ahead and we'll, we'll look at maybe one of uh, the most important factors. What did the birds make of all this? So again, uh, knowing that forests respond in forest time, uh, measuring success over decades rather than years, um, we have to keep that in mind, but we have some really encouraging initial information. So we've been doing those bird counts uh, for about a decade now. And if we compare three years of pre-harvest data at the beginning of the time period with uh, three years of the most recent post-harvest data, we see some pretty interesting stuff. Um, one <clears throat> is that we've kept our most common species common. So species like ovenbird, red-eyed vireo, black-throated blues, black-throated greens, they were all here before, and they're here in similar relative abundance uh, numbers now after the harvest. So we've kept those guys around, which is what we wanted. Um, our overall species diversity went up by three species. So we went from 30 to 33 total species. Um, we had a few species come in and out, but I think the most notable additions are some bird species that need young or shrubby forest habitat. So morning warblers, chestnut-sided warblers, common yellow throats, 
Uh, and we even had a Canada warbler present on the edge of the stand near one of the forested wetlands, which is notable since this species is declining more rapidly than many others in the state. Um, we'd like to think that these birds are here now because of the response to our silviculture. And then lastly, um, we have an increase relative abundance for species like wood thrush, veery, and eastern wood peewee, uh, all of which, uh, who do we have here? Steve, help me with these photos. We have uh, the eastern wood peewee on the upper right, um, winter wren in the lower right. Oh, and there's the Canada warbler uh, got there on the left. So um, again, increase in relative abundance of winter wren, veery, and uh, eastern wood peewee. And this is likely uh, a result of the structural changes. So winter wrens are keying in on that messy, fine woody material after the harvest. Um, veeries are liking that better developed understory and eastern wood peewees are using those canopy gaps for insect foraging. So this is all great news and it feels like we're headed in the right direction. Um, I wanted to wrap up here with a few more slides to quickly address a few operational considerations that we incorporated into the harvest planning. You know, um, some of these things we might have done anyway, but as Steve likes to describe uh, the practice of intentionality, the act of doing something specifically for an intended desired outcome, you know, it's, it's worth highlighting these intentional considerations. So we had to upgrade our seasonal access road to, to start the harvest, to get our equipment and our trucks into the landing. So one conventional way to do that would have been to daylight the road, cutting back the trees on the edges to really open it up and uh, dry things out give us lots of room to move equipment around. But we made a concerted effort to keep the road narrow. And as you can see in the photo on the right, we we're able to maintain a canopy over most of, most of the road. So uh, we did this while still meeting our access needs, but also reducing fragmentation and all that comes along with it, including things like brown-headed cowbirds from the uh, agricultural lands of the South. Next, we had to choose uh, an equipment mix for this operation. So we were lucky to be able to work with a local contractor, Warren Hill, first rate operator. Um, really enjoyed working with him on this project and, and we're continuing to do so. Um, this cut the lake uh, system uh, has many advantages and let me describe it quickly for those that aren't familiar. Uh, the big piece of equipment, the processor, that's the one that cuts the trees down, actually fells the tree, turns it sideways, and then runs the stem through rollers to take the limbs off right in place. And then it cuts the trees into sections, logs, firewood, and pulp, and piles in there at the stump. And then um, along comes a forwarder. It's like a little log truck that's made for the woods, gathers up all these sections and brings them out to the landing to be placed on the, on the log truck, the ones that you meet out on the, on the roads. So like I said, lots of benefits to this, to this system, um, but being mechanized, it allowed us to harvest lots of low-grade wood um, to really improve the timber quality of, of, the, of the forest. Um, but a real highlight was, was uh, the limbing in the woods. So leaving all that fine woody material right on site rather than removing uh, in, it in whole trees and bringing it out to the landing. Uh, the next habitat element uh, is really about that, that uh, woody material. So like we've talked about before, um, coarse woody material as well, uh, we intentionally uh, tried to cut and leave some of these low quality trees on site. So I took, uh, took a lesson from my colleague, Dave McMath, and we marked some of these trees with a, a CL, which stood for cut and leave. So we asked the operator to actually cut those and drop them whole down on the ground to increase our coarse woody material. And of course, we've talked about fine woody material a few times. Um, and the last habitat element that we'll focus on is um, our intentional leaving of legacy trees. And now when you leave these trees, I don't like to think about it as ignoring them or working around them. We're actually leaving them with a very specific job to do. We're asking them to live, to grow old, to get cavities, and then eventually to die and become coarse wooded material. So we're leaving trees like clean beach um, that are producing mast, softwood trees within hardwood stands, and then um, many large diameter trees. And lastly, um, we just wanna note that this harvest was done in the winter. Um, this was the best choice for us for a few reasons around access, um, but we'd also note that it's the time of year that birds are not nesting. Um, so we didn't disrupt the nesting or brood rearing during the harvest. You know, we can't always do this and there's, there's actually good reasons to harvest in the summer sometimes. Um, 
But in this case, it was an added benefit to have a winter harvest and seemed appropriate for the, for the demonstration site. So I'm gonna wrap it up there, Steve, and, and turn it back to you. Great, awesome, Dan, that was really great. Thanks for, for sharing that. Again, that practitioner's perspective on how all this stuff kind of comes into play. And I, you know, I particularly like that you discuss not, not only the kind of the planning aspects of managing the forest with birds in mind, but then also getting some of these operational um, things to think about as well um, here towards the end of your presentation. So really great. And it's, it's always fun to see. And I also can I say, Dan, that, you know, this was kind of a case study for VLT at, at Mud Pond that you managed, but as, as you did allude to, um, there are a few other Vermont Land Trust owned parcels where similar, um, similar activities are happening. The forest bird habitat assessments are being incorporated into inventories that then help to uh, guide the, the actual creation of the management plan and so the cultural prescriptions that, that are therein, um, as well as the operational pieces. So I uh, really appreciate your, your perspective on all of this. So that kind of concludes the, the formalized part of things. I did wanna, before we, we kind of get to the questions um, here, I wanted to just remind folks that we still have two more webinars coming up. Um, the next one will be next Wednesday on September 29th, and that is Bird Friendly Forestry Practices and Strategies for Landowners. And my guest next week will be Nancy Patch, who's um, a county forester with the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, and has also been a very important and key partner with Audubon on uh, development and delivery of all of our foresters for the birds uh, type programming. So um, hopefully you can join us for that. And then we'll skip a week, and our last webinar will be on October 13th. Um, where we'll give here really from a variety of states throughout the RCP network on what opportunities, uh, particularly from the, the bird perspective, Audubon perspective, that exist within those different states for engaging landowners, land management professionals, foresters um, in managing forests with birds in mind and, and what some of those, those opportunities may be. So make sure if you have not yet registered for those, please, please do so. Um, hope you can join us. Uh, on the SAF credit, uh, part for either Vermont Forester Licensing. I uh, know there's some other states that, that have Forester Licensing or SAF um, accreditation. Uh, there is going to be, I think it's already been put into the chat, um, a link to a Google form where you can put in your, your information so that we can make sure to pass that on to SAF and, and get you the, the one uh, category one CFE for this workshop here today. Um, and as always, if you have specific questions related to forestry for the birds, forest management with birds in mind, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. And if you'd like to learn more about um, some of the work of Highstead and Northeast Bird Habitat Conservation Initi Initiative, uh, feel free to reach out to either Katie and or Sarah for those, those things. So that's the kind of, we'll wrap the formalized part of things here. I know, you know some people, we are at three o'clock. Um, if folks have a hard stop there, um, thank you for being with us, but we are going to stay on for those who have the time. Um, it looks like we've got a number of questions to, uh, to discuss here in the chat, and we will do that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. We can all see each other. And we'll go from there. So Katie or Sarah, um, you've had a chance to kind of look at, do we have any questions in the chat? We do, we have some fantastic questions in the chat um, okay. that I'm trying to get to at the moment, but for some reason the chat has disappeared on me. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, Steve and Dan, thank you so much. That was a really, um, there we go. That was a really great, great talk, really informative. Um, and I think the first question that we can go to is from Michael. Um, how are the understory and midstory heights, one to six and six to 30 feet determined? Um, and our forestry, and he says our forestry for Michigan birds groups has chatted about this. And at the moment, we decided not to portray the layers with hard numbers um, yep. like this. I'm just curious in case we should reconsider our thoughts. Yeah, great question, Michael. Thanks, thanks for asking. Um, so we, you know, you'll note that in the birds that I kind of have highlighted it when I, when I show the mature forest and young forest, we, we have a, a group of 12 birds here in Vermont that we really talk a lot about and focus our, our um, 
outreach on that we call the birders dozen. And there's certainly, they are um, surrogates, certainly for a much, much larger group of birds that utilize different forest age classes and structural conditions, but they're kind of those birds that I like to say are relatively easy to identify by sight or sound um, compared to some of the others. And so when we looked at the literature on where these birds nest, you can start to see that there's, there's partitioning out of, of different layers that birds are found in. So we use these numbers of, of one to six and six to 30. Um, I mean, to some degree they're, they, they are somewhat arbitrary and could be adjusted, but we certainly know that this understory, um, black-throated blue warbler, which we, we would define as an understory nesting bird, the literature would suggest that the majority of their nesting is less than six feet in height. So they're, they're not nesting higher than that. And that's a bird that um, really exclusively nests there. So, so we said, okay, six feet would be a good number to kind of think about for that specific layer. Then we moved to the mid story, that six to 30 foot range. And I'll pick, pick the, the wood thrush again here, uh, just because we mentioned it already. Once again, the literature shows that their nesting height range, and it's very variable for most of these birds. It's, it's not that they just nest at six feet and, and nowhere else but the majority of nests in different studies will show that somewhere within that range is where we tend to find those birds nesting. So they were, these height ranges were somewhat specific to the birds that we really focus on in our outreach efforts and our, in our conservation activities. Um, and that's how we derive them. I wanted to mention, uh, just Colby put a link uh, in the chat to the birders dozen that you just mentioned, Steve. Great, um, thanks. Mm -hmm. a shout out. So, Steve, Teresa has a question. What is a good size of cut for creating young forest to get your three to five percent component? Is smaller patch cutting on a one to five acre basis better than larger cuts, say 10 acres and larger? Yeah, another outstanding question. So, and, and I, I should have um, kind of included this in the definition when I was going through what young forest was and, and neglected to do so. So, this is a good reminder. Um, so typically, in order to get any of those young forest nesting species that we focused on, um, ideally, it would be, if you just had one opening, it would be about two acres in size or maybe larger. But if you have a number of openings in relatively close proximity to one another, you could go down to an acre in size and you kind of get this collective of, of one acre openings then that, that seem to attract birds like chestnut-sided warbler and white-throated sparrow into them. Um, so that's kind of the minimum range when we think young forest, it's that one to two acre is like the minimum threshold if we want to encourage those birds. The other thing that I want to make sure is we clarify, because I think sometimes there's a confusion on it. We're talking here today um, and in this webinar series about forest nesting birds as opposed to shrubland birds, because there can be somewhat of a distinction there and a shrubland bird, and it's and also geographically like in Vermont, golden wing warblers, which is um, you know, a, definitely a high priority bird for us, is more of that nesting in those shrublands, those old agricultural fields that are now reverting back to forest. But if you go to, and I don't know if anyone here is from Pennsylvania um, and further south, it's a forest bird where you do some of these uh, gap creation um, group selections and such that get some regeneration. And, and those tend to be where you find the nesting golden wing warbler. So we're focusing on forest birds that use this, these young stages of a forest development as opposed to more of a shrubland or like a, like a, a brown thrasher or a towhee, which in, in Northern New England here tend to be more shrubland and not forest specific birds. So just kind of that distinction I wanna give there. Um, to the question of is a one to five acre patch better than um, say 10 acres or larger? Um, there's a lot that's in that question. Um, from my perspective, I think it has a lot to do with what the for first and foremost, what our forest that we're managing is offering us. So if we have forests that are um, have a very high percentage of lower quality uh, from a timber standpoint, wood, uh, tree health, then doing larger cuts would silviculturally make sense. But if we have higher quality wood, um, AGS, acceptable growing stock, would be one way to think about it. It certainly doesn't make sense um, in most stands 
to go in there and be doing those those bigger openings. So so that's one consideration that I would think about. I'll let Dan chime in on this as well. And then there's also there's another part of this we didn't talk about today, which is not only are these places nesting habitat for birds like we saw in our birders dozen, but they're also post breeding habitat um, for birds that nested in the mature forest. So just take a scarlet tanager, which we we showed in the mature forest. That's where it nests. But we know the, the science is telling us that post breeding, pre migration, those adult scarlet tanagers are going with their young into these patches of young forest. And in that scenario, we find that the larger openings tend to be preferable, say the 10 acre opening, to a smaller two to three acre opening, because they're looking for a place they can really get in the middle there, as opposed to being on the edge. So there's more area to edge ratio in the, in the larger openings. So I think the really the, the, the conclusion that I would draw from that is that a range of sizes are desirable based on what the forest that we're managing is offering us. You wanna add anything to that, Dan? That was great, I have nothing to add, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, so Brian asks a question. When thinking about the 2,500 acre landscapes and forest age distribu distribution, do you ever consider what neighbors could do? For example, if the neighbors are large industrial forests, they may help you out by creating young forests on their land, then mature forests would be needed in the landscape. And I know, um, Dan, you alluded to this a little bit um, in your talk. Yeah, maybe Dan will let you take a first stab at that. Sure, yeah, so in our situation, we were fortunate to be able to partner with, with the Nature Conservancy on their adjacent lands, and that is a parcel that they actively manage, uh, and they have started uh, implementing um, similar treatments um, on on their on their land in the last few years with their consulting forester. So, and that was really a stepping off point to reach out to a few other smaller landowners um, in the neighborhood that uh, were even smaller than our our state current use twenty five uh, acre minimum for UVA enrollment, uh, and started conversations with them about what does management of their 10 acre parcel look like. They, they love to hear that we were managing for birds and what could they do to, to do the same things on their land. So yeah, definitely reaching across uh, boundaries to talk to neighbors, both small and large. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I would just add that this is, this is kind of where being maybe a little more conservative in managing to create those young forest conditions can also come in as a benefit because we often don't know what will happen on that uh, adjoining landowner. You know, what are they gonna do within that landscape? And so if we say, well, we don't have anything right now in terms of young forest, so let's, let's go and you know, let's put 10% on here. And then we find out that two years later, our neighbor who owns 50% of the landscape, as an example, does something, um, some pretty heavy uh, harvesting as well to create those conditions. Now we might have 20, 25% young forest on that landscape. So, you know, the question I, I will often say to someone is, how long does it take to grow a hundred year old forest? The answer is a hundred years. How long does it take to create a two acre opening to develop into young forest? Well, depends on what material, what equipment you use to create the opening. And then within three years or so, you, you kind of get the birds that you want. So that just says to us, we can always go back and cut more if we think that it's necessary and desirable, but it's gonna take a lot longer to get that older structurally complex forest. Um, so a little more conservative side on the harvesting now until we find out what the future holds for us. And I'll, I'm just looking at the, the list here now, questions as well. Charles, uh, great question. What is a responsibility bird? Kind of use that term um, here a bit. Um, think of it as a priority species. Uh, we have used responsibility bird. It's, it's used by some other bird conservation groups as well. Um, and we use that to really refer to the birds that fit one of two criteria. One being um, what you may most expect. It's a species which has shown um, significant or at least some population decline throughout its breeding range. So bird, these migratory birds, when they're here, are, or even their global po populations are showing decline. So those would be a conservation priority. They're a responsibility to us to think about. But the other, the other group that we talk about in the same um, 
term of responsibility birds are birds that are actually doing okay. As Dan said, um, the bird response at Mud Pond was keeping common birds common. And when he says that, he refers to birds that we are kind of at the core of their breeding range. And some of them are doing quite well, like oven birds um, are doing quite well. In Vermont, black-throated blue warblers are doing quite well. Their populations are at least stable, if not increasing in places. But they're still priority birds for us for responsibility species because we're really at the core of their, their breeding range. So if our forests here, and, and when I say we, I mean really the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states are tend to be the core breeding habitat and up into the Gaspé Peninsula through uh, as well in Canada. We tend to be where the majority of those bird species breeding population comes to. So if we don't, if we don't think of it as having a responsibility to keep them here on the landscape, we can easily do things um, that end up being causing them to be um, experiencing population declines in the future. So it's uh, it's really proactive conservation there as opposed to reactive responding to a decline. I think the next question is for you, Dan. The equipment that was used to log uh, the, that stand at Mud Pond, and also yeah. from Charles. Great. Um, so we did touch on the fact that that was a, a cut to length system specifically. I mean, that one, um, Warren was an early adopter of that equipment. So uh, early 2000s is when he bought that. So his his mix is vintage and it's old, it's Timco equipment. Um, the carrier might've been a, a 425, I can't remember specifically. And I, he has a fixed processing head. I can't remember uh, the name of the processing head. At the time he was, he was using a, a Timco forwarder, which he's recently um, traded out for a newer one as well. So we're going to stick with that. Dan, I'm going to jump down here a little bit to, to Phil. Hey, Phil. Um, he's curious to hear thoughts on the drawbacks of the cut to length system, especially as it relates to the management of bird habitat management goals. That's a great question. And Phil, probably, you know, I think you're aware, you're alluding to this, that, um, you know, every equipment mix has pluses and minuses, and you really have to fit it into the stand and the landowner objectives and the, and the outcomes you want. And it's as much about the operator uh, and their care in it as, as it is about the equipment, whether it's a horse or a skitter or, um, or a grapple skitter. Um, but a few things come to mind. Um, you know, if you were on a particularly wet site um, and you were needing to put your brush that was being delimbed uh, off the treetops in the trail to hold up the forwarder to protect the soil, which is common practice, um, if you needed to do that everywhere, uh, then you'd be putting a lot of that fine woody material in the trails and crushing it down, which I think it would still have a purpose because it would, it would be there um, <clears throat> and be, you know, be thick in a mat it would probably, it wouldn't be evenly distributed um, and it wouldn't have kind of the, the same characteristics as it would with a, you know, with a single tree fall creates or a group of tree falls. Um, but that wasn't the case for us. We were able to actually disperse that material around and, and, and talk to Warren about that. Um, you know, some other limitations that might, that might come to mind. Um, as I mentioned, Warren had a fixed head processor, which means he was able to actually pick up trees, move them around and put them where he wanted them, as opposed to something like uh, a lot of processors or, or dangle heads. So there's much uh, less control over where the tree goes uh, when it falls. So if you're in a stand where you're trying to protect lots of advanced regeneration, the dangle head processor might provoke, just pose more challenges. Um, those, are the, those are the big ones. Again, I think it's as much about you know, the care taken with the equipment uh, in many cases, as it is about the equipment itself. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. We'll stick with Phil. Um, he had another question um, prior to that about the frequency of inventorying forest birds and uh, doing vegetation uh, surveys on lands enrolled in this program. So just to, to clarify, Phil, that we do kind of these detailed bird surveys, bird monitoring, and uh, inventory work really only on sites that are we um, identify as demonstration sites for our foresters for the birds. And um, as Dan said, we had nine original. Those have kind of ebbed and, ebbed and flowed over time. Um, some, some of them have changed ownership. We had one private land that changed ownership and didn't continue. Um, and it's also really related to, to resources. Who can do this stuff? 
you know, Dan's kind of an interesting case because um, he's out there at Mud Pond, he's doing bird surveys every year. And ideally, we are doing our bird surveys annually at each of these demonstration sites. Um, it's often a, a factor of do we, is it, can I get to it or do we have a volunteer that can get to it? Last year with COVID, we did end up missing a few of our sites because there were often multiple people that would go together involved from volunteers um, and it just didn't happen. So, so ideally it's, it's annually and Dan has been doing a great job um, in making that happen in Mud Pond. On the vegetation stuff, it tends to be a lot related to um, is the management plan for that site going to be due for um, an update and revisiting that. Um, it, just so happened that for Mud Pond, that that management plan update, what was it, just a, two years ago, maybe? That's right. Okay. Um, and so Dan went back out there to do that re-inventory, including those habitat attributes. Other sites we haven't um, had a chance to get back to yet because we're, we're gonna wait until we get closer to the update for the forest management plan, which tend to be here in Vermont, a 10 year cycle. So, um, it really, really comes down though. Ideally, you know, we'd love to have bird surveys every year, vegetation surveys, we could probably get away with every five years um, would be fine to see that response, but it does come down to the ability of having the resources to, to get it done. It always does. Um, let's see, so here we go down. Steve, it looks like we have one more question from Rob. We have almost no understory due to an overabundance of deer. We cannot solve the deer problem, but would you recommend more cutting to let more light in? Yeah, you know, I think there's there's different a couple different things that are going on there. Obviously, in some places we do have such a overabundance of deer that every little seedling that, that gets established doesn't get established because it gets browsed on. Um, some larger openings can, can be used to the idea being that we can overwhelm the deer. There's just so much regeneration that they, they can't tend to get to it all. Um, so that could be an option depending on your site, what your, what your other objectives are. You know, do you want to, if you're thinking really big, that acre plus, do you, are you looking to create young forest habitat in order to do that? Um, and again, what is the site offering you? But, uh, it is one option, I would say, is some bigger openings with the idea, again, of over, so much regeneration happening that you're overwhelming them. Um, there's also, and I'm not sure where Rob is, is joining us from, but um, you know, is there opportunity to, um, to allow hunting on those areas to try to do so, to, to help reduce that population of deer to some degree? You know, there's a variety of tools that are outside of kind of forest management that we might also think about in those particular cases. And it's really interesting when you go, you know, sometimes people wonder, wonder if they do have a deer issue. Um, there's no better way to, to answer that question than if you have the, the ability to put up a deer exclosure where you fence off with high fence, a small area of your forest that the deer won't be able to get into and see how the regeneration over a few years in that exclosure is different than, than outside of it. Um, that can give you a really good indication of actually if, if you have an issue. Anything yeah, to add to add, yeah, just, um, and I think again, Rob, not knowing where you are, but um, the presence of invasive species in your landscape would be another important consideration. So you wouldn't want to do a large cut just to invite invasive species to establish both from a management standpoint, um, but also from a habitat standpoint. Without, without a plan to control those. Great point. Okay, I think it looks like we got through them. Great questions. Um, so I think at this point, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Again, appreciate everybody sticking around here to, to, to go through these. You know, it's always the thought provoking stuff that gets us thinking, you know, it's, it's um, there's always something new to think about in all of this. There's no one answer to any of the questions, there's, there's multiple ways to address them. And I appreciate getting us, folks giving us the opportunity to, to think about some of these things. So again, thanks for being here. Hopefully you'll be able to join us next week um, and we will look forward to seeing you then. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.